Hi everyone, and welcome to this brief pre-concert talk. My name is Natalie, and I'm a programmer with Esplanade Theatres on the Bay. I'll be taking you through the three works today before we hear them in concert. On the program are two violin concertos by Bach, an overture by Telemann that he wrote for one of his operas, and it's quite a pity that only two of Bach's violin concertos survive. I'm sure he must have written a few more works besides the double violin concerto because he was directing the Leipzig Collegium Musicum from 1729 to 1737. This was an ensemble consisting mostly of university students, refounded by Telemann in 1702 and led by a succession of illustrious music directors before Bach. Anyway, just having two solo violin concertos make them all the more precious and well-known. I'll speak a little about the music later, and let's first talk about the context in which the music was conceived and performed. So come with me back in time for a moment and imagine that it is Friday evening in the year 1730 in Leipzig, Germany. Just off the market square on the most elegant street, there are coloured awnings and a door that leads into Herr Zimmermann's cafe. Imagine the aroma of fragrant roasted coffee mixing with the floral scents from the garden and listen to the orchestra tuning up. You might even recognise the guy sitting at the harpsichord. Perhaps you've seen him on the organ at church. It's Johann Sebastian Bach. Very much like bubble tea in Singapore, coffee had just made its appearance in the city a few decades ago and was getting to be a very popular drink of choice. Coffee houses were open and became social meeting places where men gathered met and exchanged ideas. I say men because women were forbidden from frequenting coffee houses as coffee was seen as a dangerous stimulant and some had frowned upon this emerging cafe nightlife as Bach's coffee cantata reveals. However, in Gottfried Zimmermann's cafe, women were welcome at these public concerts. Because of this, his cafe became a social meeting place for a diverse clientele of men and women book traders, university students, intellectuals, and socialites. Zimmermann's cafe was different and popular because he invited musicians of the Leipzig Collegium Musicum to perform informal concerts every Friday evening from 8pm to 10pm. He even kept a collection of instruments on the premises for performers to use, including a set of stringed instruments, wind instruments, and a harpsichord. These concerts were free of charge as well because Zimmerman was making enough money off the sale of drinks from his cafe. Concerts at the cafe featured a mix of progressive and appealing instrumental and vocal music, including overtures, concertos, secular cantatas, instrumental sonatas and harpsichord music, offering instrumentalists their chance at taking the limelight as soloists. It might be hard to think of Baroque music now that we know and love it as progressive music of the future, but that's exactly what it was back then. As director of the Collegium Musicum, Bach's duty was not only to conduct and compose, but also to put together the concert programmes. Although exact programmes for the concerts do not survive, some of the manuscripts do, many of them copied by C.P.E. Bach, who also played harpsichord and viola in the ensemble. From this, we know that Bach often recycled and arranged his earlier pieces for the Collegium. He also programmed music by his contemporaries such as Handel and his predecessor and friend Telemann. We don't know if the two concertos in today's concert were composed in 1730, as some musicologists say, or earlier during the period Bach lived in Anhalt Kirtan, but they may very well have been pieces that were performed in some of these coffeehouse concerts. Both of the concertos were cast in three-movement Italian Baroque style of having a slow movement in between two fast movements, and both give opportunities for soloists and orchestra to shine. For the concerto in A minor, BWV 1041, the counterpoint in the opening allegro is beautifully crafted. Unlike his Italian co counterparts such as Vivaldi, Bach integrates the soloist and orchestra for a more cohesive sound. In the andante that follows, the strings play short sighs that start off the slow movement, but the soloist is given long and lyrical me melodic lines with the chance for them to embellish over the short sighs that make up the accompaniment. The finale is a lively jig that we usually hear in Bach's orchestral suites or keyboard suites with a nimble melody line that shows off the violinist's technical prowess. In contrast to the earlier concerto, the concerto in E major, BWV 1042, has a bright and sunny disposition. 
starting off with a confident and bold declaration of an E major triad. This motif is later heard several times in various other keys in the first movement. The ensuing adagio is set in the mournful key of C-sharp minor, and over a quiet ostinato in the bass instruments, the violin weaves an intricate melody that intersperses stillness and activity. The mood lightens as the Allegro Asai finale is set as a rondo, alternating five orchestral refrains with four solo episodes that seem to increase in brilliance and virtuosity. The final work on today's program is one of Telemann's most famous orchestral works. What he calls a burlesque is actually an overture followed by a suite, telling stories from Cervantes' famous novel Don Quixote de la Mancha. This descriptive music is musical storytelling at, at its finest. In the following movements, we hear the Spanish inflections in the awakening of Don Quixote, an exaggerated sighs of love for the Princess Dulcinea, who really is a peasant girl, and the witty intervallic spans of Sancho's donkey, and then the folksy and counterintuitively titled Don Quixote's Sleep, where the lively music diminishes into sweet nothing. Thank you for joining me today, and I hope you enjoy the concert.